I am Joe Julian. Uh, I am a Gloucester community member. I have been for eight years. I've uh, been the president of the, the Gloucester community. Um, I'm a contributor to both SALT and CEF. Uh, CEF to a minor degree, but I've been doing a lot of work with SALT and Gloucester especially. Um, and I'm the principal cloud engineer for IO data centers. I, uh, <coughs> IO is one of the largely privately owned data center companies, operating six data centers across three continents. IO owns two of the five largest data centers. Uh, one, the, the, I love to keep this part in too. Our new software defined service provider network <coughs> allows virtual cross connects without all the time and expense of running cables or. Well, it's, it's, it's really actually pretty cool. <laughs> so, the pitch over. <coughs> So configuration management, by and large, operates in a vacuum. The, uh, the idea is that you can apply a state to a machine and it becomes whatever it's supposed to be. Um, that generally discounts anything that's happening to any other machines. So that's great if you're trying to deploy a web server or anything that, that you can actually determ deterministically define how it's gonna be configured. But with clusters, we have this weird thing where they depend on each other, and if if you try to define a Ceph <coughs> monitor node all by itself, it's going to be a monitor node all by itself, and the rest of the the, uh, the data is going to be lost because it's not part of the entire cluster. <coughs> so, so there has to be some way of doing coordination between all these different nodes in order to to successfully deploy them. So at I.O., we, were trying to, we, we started this product that I'm currently working on, and our goals were to pixie boot all our machines. So every machine in our cloud services was supposed to be able to pixie boot, was supposed to have a RAM disk root, and they were supposed to be able to configure themselves deterministically using salt and storing whatever application data they might need in console, hopefully in order to bootstrap the machines. And it quickly became obvious that that was not going to work. There's way too much information stored in, for instance, the Ceph monitor node or a, or a cluster uh, state directory for this to work correctly. So I got the great, bright idea of using semaphores. Um, so we use semaphores using console KV values. Um, console has the ability to lock a KV a key before doing anything with it. And if another node encounters that same key, it will wait until either time's out or until the lock is released. So doing that, you can you can get to that point in, the, in this configuration, lock this key and say, I'm only gonna be able to do this next piece of configuration until it's finished and the next machine should be able to take over and do its same configuration. Hopefully, sharing the data that's been shared through this key. Uh, turns out it's the wrong way to do it. Two, well, lots and lots of complications, lots of potential failure methods, which I could go into all day, but that would bore everybody to sleep. Um, it's, it's complicated. It requires code outside of salt because salt modules all happen before the states happen. So, and it's just really, really ugly. So to, to do a Ceph monitor node, I would have to create a session, lock a console key value, or wait. Um, the node would have to become a monitor node. We'd have to check to see if it's the first one, and if it was, it would add itself. If it wasn't, it would add the other known monitor nodes. The only way to get that information is through the, the value stored in console. Um, and then we would have to unlock the key and destroy the session. So that's, that's basically how semaphores work. Um, more visually, it's a semaphore race. Um, I thought that was appropriate for this area. <laughs> so they're racing along, they're doing all their pre-configuration, and they get to the part where they have to create a monitor node. One's allowed through, the other two have to stop at the stop sign and wait. And we have to wait until it is clear of that entire monitor node creation section. Then the next one's allowed to go through and as you can see, this this there's a lot of wait time there. They were 
they could be doing something useful, but instead they're just sitting there waiting for the next thing to be able to happen. Even worse, when you create the OSDs, the OSD creation expects all the monitors that are known to be up and running, which means that they sit there and they try a network connection, and then they time out, and then they try another network connection, and then they time out. And so finally it happens. And it takes, it, it was taking a long time to, to get our Ceph nodes up and running <clears throat> using, using uh, semaphores. And it looks easy. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's that bad. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, like I said, the salt modules all run before states, and there's no way to trigger something if a state fails. If a state fails, then anything that was re depending on it would fail, but there's no way to make it do something else. So if it worked, that's hard to read. If it worked this way, and I'm sorry that that's so hard to read, um, you'd, you'd have something like this in, in salt, where you have a, have a uh, module that would lock, the, lock it, you get the information, you do the state. If it was successful, you do something. If it wasn't successful, you'd still unlock it. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't work. That could be added fairly easily. This is just magic because it doesn't work. I mean, there's no such thing. There's no way to tell whether a state has succeeded or not, especially in a module, because what's then actually going to happen is these modules are going to run. It's going to end up. It's going to do. It's going to lock the key value. It's going to get the key value. It's going to unlock the key value, and then it's going to run the state. So that would then allow the, all of your monitors to be, think that they were the only ones. All of them were going to set themselves up all by themselves, and none of them are going to communicate because the modules are all run first. So what I had to do is this big wall of Python. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. It's ugly and and stupid. <laughs> and, and basically, I had to do all those steps in Python, you know, locking it, creating the monitor, checking the states of the monitors to see whether or not we need to add other nodes. Big, long, and ugly, and it's outside of your your uh, state management tool. <coughs> Completely the wrong way to do it. You should never have to run a big script in order to do your state management. Plus, there's a lot of other routes to failure. Um, if your console loses its data, well, we're talking about booting them all up of, of Pixie and running off RAM disks, so of course they're going to lose data. So that didn't work. Um, even if we store data on some sort of hard device, if they get out of sync, if they uh, go split brain, which console seems to be liking to do a lot for us. Um, just too many, state, too many failure states available through console alone. Plus, there's a lot of change states that will fail later down the road, which, again, I could, to describe the failure states, that would take an hour. But suffice to say, there's a lot of them. So my solution was, I had to come back at this again. We're uh, switching back from stuff back to Gluster. So I had to rewrite the states anyway. I think, okay, well, let's get rid of this stupid semaphore thing and, do, and find a better way to do it. Solution is salt reactor plus the salt data tool. Um, so <clears throat> the way a reactor works is events and reactions. A, uh, a state file will create an event. The it'll pass it through zero MQ or React, depending on which version of salt you're using. Um, the uh, server would then get that message, do something, and then could possibly perform another action on the menu. So here's what one basically looks like. Here's my cluster in it. Um, install the package, make sure the service is running. And this is the magic. Here's where, here's where I created an event. Um, as you can see, basically, you, know, you tell it we're going to watch, we're going to watch something. This service cluster service. When it happens, we're going to create this event. It's going to, we're going to, have to give it an arbitrary name. We're going to pass it some data. We can or cannot pass it the pillar data, which. I don't know if anybody knows salt, but pillar data is basically your entire configuration state data. Um, and so that's going to create this, this bit of data that it passes through through zero or through the message bus back to this the master. As you can see, here's our tag that we created. It's going to give it some some information, the timestamp, which minion did it, the fact that it's a minion event instead of a server event. 
Um, there's our data. You know, as it uh, merged the pillar data with our our manual data, so you would want to use pillar as one of your variable names. <coughs> so it goes back to the master. The master then receives this this tag. It looks at this reactor table, matches whichever the first one matches. Um, so in this case, it's IO cluster installed. And then tells it what to do with it. They run <coughs> this pure SLS state. That's, um, you could use wildcards in the uh, tag matches. In fact, I use that for looking at new minions that join the, the, the pool and actually just go ahead and, because our, the, way, the way this is currently designed, we can actually automatically add them to, to the trusted uh, keys. So I just look, and if it's a new, a new one, I add it to the keys, I tell it to start over again, it starts over again, it's really cool. So anyway, um, so my, this, this salt state here is run on the master. On, the, on that master state, I do a bunch of work, I mean, this is all very generic. I determine whether, whether it's ready. I prepare the data to, to go to the, the minion. I'll get the list of all installed nodes. I'll build a list of peers. I can actually test and see if all the peers are up. Um, I can either do that by taking the data that came from every reaction and storing it someplace and then looking to see if this is the last one. Um, or I could actually create another action that would go out to the minions and say, do this action, report back, and then collect all the data from all the minions, and then <coughs> do it again. In this particular case, I'm just going to go drop through. If this is the last uh, peer in the list, um, well, if it's not the last peer in the list, don't do anything. Then we don't have to worry about semaphores or locks or any of that kind of stuff. It just, it's not ready yet, so don't do anything. Um, if it is the last one, then we check to see if the peer group already exists. Um, this is in case we're actually actively changing the volume or re-adding this node or adding this node to an existing volume. If there's already a peer group, cluster requires that the new node be added from one of the trusted peers. The, uh, the a, a, just not some random machine can just say, hey, I'm gonna be part of your cluster. That doesn't work. Um, so, so what I do is I pick the first peer that was already part of the peer group, and then, or, or if this isn't doesn't exist at all, I'll just use the one that just came in. Um, I'll save this state for comparison later, which I'm doing here, this is the way I'm doing it now, which is using the salt data tool. That just stores it on the salt master. We only need one master for each of our, our services, because we split them up into small enough chunks to where we don't need to manage a thousand machines with one salt master. But if you did need to manage a thousand machines with salt, one salt master, you can, there's this SDB tool, which you can use using a URL method to set, in this particular case, SDB, use a key value there. You could use a key value in whatever, um, Elastic, Elasticsearch, whatever. Um, and then of course I remove the peer yourself from the list because it doesn't need to probe itself. So this is, this is the next section that actually does something. So this is still on the master. The master is going to run this local state SLS. Um, the local t keyword in the reactor events is the, an async version of the local client class in salt. So if you run a salt local command like that, it will uh, It'll run this local client class. Well, this is cool because now we can send commands back to the minion in whatever shape, in whatever form we want. It's just similar to you could do from a command line. So in this case, we're going to do the state.sls that runs a specific state file. Um, the state file we want to run is cluster.peer. Target is going to be whichever node we want to run this on. Um, KWR, so those are the keyword arguments that are going to be passed to the state.sls. Uh, salt module, um, Q, Q, true or false, if it's false, it'll fail if there's another uh, uh, state running. Um, if it's true, it'll wait. Concurrent, however, will let it 
start right away so I can actually run multiple states simultaneously. Um, and since we don't have to worry about another peer running, if, if our, if our uh, machine was still running high state and still trying to do a bunch of other configuration options, we'd already gotten the event, we already know what needs to happen next. So we can go ahead and run this, this cluster peering while other stuff is happening be a little bit more efficient. Um, and of course, pillar. Now, notice here we don't have the whole big list of pillar data that we would have had before. We're only going to send it the specific data. We're going to send it one dict with uh, event data telling it what nodes and what volume to use. <coughs> the, the rest of configuring cluster doesn't care about anything else. It just needs that information. So then this goes over to the minion through the, uh, the message bus. The minions gets this and says, okay, I just have to run pure SOS. This makes it much cleaner. This is the entire file. There's nothing pe peeled out here to make it more readable. Um, all it has to know is it has to run cluster, the cluster FS peered. It, uses, it has to peer it against those names, which come from that event data that we just passed in the data section. That, that's it. That's, that's how simple that gets. That's one of the reasons why this is so much cleaner, so much you know, easier to manage, easier to read. Um, and then I call the next peer event. The next peer event is going to tell it that it's all done here. It's peered. And I'm talking too fast. Sorry. Um, yeah. So of course that would go back to the reactor. The reactor would find the next. Thing that the next tag that matches, and it'll run the next um, state. Wow. You know, this time got at 31 minutes when I did it in my head. So, other possible uses um, disk prep in parallel. So, our machines, uh, our storage servers have 35 disks each, 36 disks each. Um, so, if they have to format each one of them in series, it takes a little over half an hour. Using state, using a reactor, I can have, send a message that says, okay, I'm ready to, to format my disk. <coughs> the master will send out 36 different messages to go ahead and format disks and start running the, the states for each disk. Each di disk will get formatted in parallel. Fin you can finish the whole thing in about five minutes instead of a half an hour. Um, you can do container VM allocation after your storage is configured. So you'd, have, you'd send an event that says, okay, my storage is configured, goes back to the master, the master says, okay, now we can do VMs, so now we're gonna send out a message to create the VM images and, and put them on the storage the way it's supposed to be. Or maybe you could just use it to ensure that your beer and pizza are served in parallel. Uh, 